Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ollie. I'm a final year medical student at the University of Warwick and welcome back to my interview prep series to help you land your place at medical school. Today we're going to be talking about the sugar tax. It's an example of a public health initiative and a great example to talk about at your medical school interview if it comes up. But it might be framed under the type of question where your interviewer is asking you your opinion. Is it a good idea? Is it an effective solution? So today we're going to explore the concept of the sugar tax, what it is, how it's supposed to work, and the benefits and drawbacks of this public health initiative that has been tried, and we can talk about how successful it has been. So just for a bit of background, the science is pretty clear that excessive sugar consumption for most people in society can lead to several problems, whether that's obesity, diabetes, tooth decay. So the sugar tax was proposed by public health experts as a way to try and combat this problem, the logic being, that if we introduce this tax, we raise the price of these products that are high in sugar. And because consumers are very sensitive to price, this means people are less likely to buy these products and in turn make them less likely to consume large amounts of sugar. And crucially to bring it back to the healthcare side of things, because they're consuming less sugar, they're less likely and less at risk of developing obesity, diabetes, tooth decay. Because we're lowering the incidence of these secondary conditions, that means that the NHS doesn't have to deal with these conditions. These conditions are very expensive for the NHS to deal with in the long run because we have to medicate people for many years and they take up time with hospital specialists and general practitioners. If we can lower the chance of people developing them in the first place, it means that the NHS has to spend less money and fewer resources looking after them. Not to mention hopefully improving their quality of life, which has to be the outcome, the goal that we want. Another advantage that proponents of the sugar tax put forward is that because it's a tax, that is levied by the government, this actually raises revenue that can be put into other systems. It was estimated that a 20% sugar tax on these products could actually raise a billion pounds of revenue for the government each year. And then the government can take this money, at least in theory, and funnel it into other services. So whether that's diabetes clinics, specialist diabetic nurses, physiotherapists for people with back pain due to degrees of obesity, whether that's diabetes clinics and endocrine consultants, diabetes specialist nurses, or physiotherapists for people who are dealing with back pain, or just contribute to lowering taxes that other people pay in other systems. And the other thing to say is that there is actually precedent for taxes like this. We know that alcohol and cigarettes are already very heavily taxed. We've done this before. We know that it's an option. We can also consider the idea that sugary products, especially sugary drinks, may constitute a product which people consume in large amounts without being fully aware of the health risks associated, as well as struggling to consume less of them even if they wanted to, because sugary products are very addictive. And there is actually a name for this in economics. This is called a demerit good. And what this means in terms simple enough for me, an idiot, to understand is a good which has unintentional negative spillover effects that not only reduce benefit to other people in society, but actually because they're highly addictive, people will overconsume if the free market is left unregulated and therefore will be overproduced in response to overproduction. So you end up with this vicious cycle. And speaking of the free market, the last key advantage that I can think of is that if you raise taxes on these high in sugar products, you actually incentivize the market and producers to invest in creating healthier alternatives. As we know, customers are very sensitive to changes in price. And if these prices are artificially inflated by a tax, companies basically have no other choice but to invest in creating lower priced alternatives for people to buy. At the very least, what we'll end up with is products that appear healthier on paper, because what we know happened in practice is that companies did reduce the amount of sugar in many of their products when this was introduced, but they changed to using fats and artificial sweeteners to keep their products addictive and palatable to consumers. And of course, these things come with health problems of their own, but that's a separate story. Perhaps the biggest objection to sugar taxes is that they disproportionately affect people with lower income status. And this is true for consumption taxes of virtually any kind. That is taxes that are added to goods and services that people might want to access. And this is purely because if we artificially inflate the price of a product, that means that for someone who earns less in a given year, that whatever they buy makes up a larger percentage of their overall earnings. And therefore what we're unfortunately doing is taking more from people who have less in the first instance. And unfortunately, we also know that if someone really wants something in a market setting, 
then they're going to pay for it, regardless of the cost. So potentially all we're doing by adding sugar taxes is making it so people who earn less have to pay more relative to their total income than people who earn more without actually achieving our goal of lowering consumption of these products. We've just made it more detrimental to people to do so. And secondly, we might want to consider that these health problems that we're trying to prevent, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, tooth decay, are multifactorial and complicated and not necessarily just linked to consumption of sugary foods. There are very, very many reasons why people might develop diabetes. And even if we wiped all super sugary products off the face of the planet overnight, we'd still have very large numbers of people with diabetes. There would just be less sugary stuff for them to eat. And you may also consider that in very large campaigns like this, there is some element of unintentional discrimination against certain groups in society. Because it's not necessarily unhealthy, for example, to someone to have a high BMI or to be considered obese. So are we unfairly pointing the finger at certain groups of people, such as those who are considered obese? rather than looking at other problems, which it might be more beneficial for us to solve and would help more people. And lastly, another aspect you might wish to consider, as we should with any public health large-scale intervention, is the economic impact. Healthcare problems don't exist in a vacuum, they exist alongside basically all other social spending initiatives, which are subject to the same market forces as anything else. If we add a sugar tax and it imposes large reformulation costs on big manufacturing companies, because we've effectively changed the profits that they can make, they in response have to change the formulation of their products. That means new R&D, new marketing, new formulation. All of these things are going to lead to increased end cost to the consumer, lower wages and fewer jobs, or a combination of all three. And business owners are understandably going to ask whether it's appropriate that bodies such as Public Health England, who are staffed by doctors, clinicians and scientists who are not business owners and not economists, should have any say in what products people are able to buy or not. Just because the NHS has to ultimately deal with people who develop these chronic conditions, that doesn't necessarily give them the right to intervene in markets or indeed in people's personal choice. Because to close by bringing things back to medical ethics and medical principles, what public health campaigns like this do is that they fundamentally rely on reducing the autonomy of your consumers to spend money on what they want in order to achieve a health benefit later, which some people might argue is a heavy degree of paternalism on the part of public health bodies, but I'll leave that for you to decide. So thanks very much for watching guys, please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe and don't forget to go and check out ollieburton.com for my full suite of interview prep videos, more hints, tips and articles to help you land your place at medical school. Take care and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks very much for watching guys, if you want to support the channel there are three main ways you can do it. The first is to hit that like button, share with a friend and subscribe. The second is you can buy me a coffee using my Ko-Fi link in the video description below and help keep me awake during the editing process. The third is you can use my referral link to save 10% off your first year subscription to complete Anatomy 2021 and I'll get a small kickback when you do. Take care and I'll see you next time.